Welcome by Bailan Conference, folks. I want to thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak to you and tell you how humbled I am um, that uh, I'm able to talk to you even though I'm unable to come up there. Somehow I think I got uh, the raw end of the deal, but being able to talk to you all um, makes me happy and calls up for me all the things that are so important. We're basically at this conference talking about our identities and who we are and how we are in a land that may or may not be all or originally ours that we may not be from. And the big question we're all asking is, how do we create a home? How do we come home again? How do we get no place? How do we find peace? And can we make a home in a home that has not been ours? These are, I think, some of the questions that all of us want to explore. And I want to begin by just talking a little bit about the context of school and what schooling does. And so often as we begin to think about our identities, we tend to think of identities and who and what we are in our histories in boxes, uh, boxes whose borders are rigid rather than porous. And we try to shape ourselves by definitions that aren't necessarily our own. Even if we begin to create definitions for ourselves. Um, there was a time when I was growing up, I remember when you wouldn't say you were Indian, for instance, or Filipino. If you could pass, you'd say you're Spanish. Then all of a sudden, you know, the darker you are, the better you are, the more Filipino or the more Indian you are. All we do when we create those definitions is recreate that legacy from colonization called illegitimacy that works and breeds in all of our hearts and souls and keeps us from the totality of who we are and therefore our inability to locate ourself in place and time. School does an interesting thing in that is a great colonizer. School, of course, gives us the ability to speak, but one of the things that happens is it tricks us into being, I think, schizophrenic and think in boxes. I'm old enough to remember, for instance, that Dick and Jane reader with Spot. And you know, when I was growing up, I didn't, where I grew up, I didn't know people like Dick and Jane. And regarding dogs like Spot, they got run over by cars, they were full of fleas, we kicked them, whatever. Dick and Jane, if they came into our neighborhood, they'd get the crap beat out of them. But if I am to succeed in the classroom, I am supposed to identify with Dick and Jane and put who and what I am on the back burner. Those of us who succeed in school have successfully become schizophrenic. We learn to put the totality of our lived experience on the back burner and listen to the experience that is or in definitions of who we are by someone else, given to us by somebody else. Therefore, you go to college, you're told that the definition of the nuclear family is mother, father, siblings. And you go, well, I guess I have a dysfunctional family. But as you know, in our culture, Filipino, Indopino, American Indian cultures, auntie, uncle, grandma are all part of the nuclear family. But we, if we're disempowered, we can't raise our hand in college and say, the nuclear definition of a nuclear family for whom? So what happens is that kind of separation from our lived experience, if that continues with us, if we continue that, regardless of how we start looking at who and what we are and trying to find out who we are, we're gonna be trapped by that tendency to be looking elsewhere than rather than what's already here within us, how we've lived. Hence, you hear people say, Filipinos do this, American Indians do that. Well, and again, if you don't fit into that definition, then I guess you're not an Indian or you're not a Filipino or an uh, Indopino. I, I like, I, I saw, there's, a, I see Meti Filipinos, there's Pomo Filipinos, there's all kinds of, of folks here today. Uh, and that brings up, of course, another history. But that history is one in which too often the offspring, which are thus, the people we're here today, are struggling with how and where do we go? Rather than understanding 
that the full lived experience that we have now is not only a continuation of Filipino history and American Indian history, but are remaking it as it moves into a new and different place. We don't stop, we go on. And what we have to do is own all of that for better or for worse. Now, when in my own family, when my father, grandfather came here, he was a Monong among the first generation. Uh, they came over here, young guys, they were brought here to work, uh, faced uh, horrible discrimination. Um, the anti-miscegenation laws in California were passed in the, in, in the 30s, whereby a Filipino could not get a marriage license. It, um, and most of the, many of the Monongs throughout the West Coast here, most of them, my, my grandfather got off a boat or ship in Seattle. And they, had, they were remarkable in the way they worked together to create basically a railroad of connections from Seattle all the way down to Southern California along the Western Coast, where they would, had friends and told people where to go and how to get jobs and make connections and so on and so forth. And, Many of these men not having access to, uh, they were, it was a bachelor society. So uh, not having access to a lot of other women, the only women they really had access to were the American Indian women. Uh, if they went north all the way, you know, into British Columbia and up into Alaska, well, it's south all the way down to Southern California. So they, of course, the, and the American Indian women thought these uh, guys were a catch. They worked very hard, they, were, they took good care of their families, and uh, so we had a mixing. But there, something also made it easy because the Filipino men coming, many of them from the provinces in the Philippines, were familiar with indigenous traditions, how indigenous people worked. So it was, I hate to use the word natural, but it was an easy fit for these guys to communicate and work in the American Indian communities, whereby so many of them became, took part in the actual rituals that were going on here. I know up at Kashaya, there was a Filipino man, um, he's a great patriarch of that community, who in all the ceremonies was the fire tender, a very important position. Um, in, in all the, in, for the ceremonies. Also, the courting was very similar. In the, many of the provinces, if a man wanted a woman, he would bring a sack of whatever goods he had and go to the girl's parents' house and put it on her porch, and if they took it in, he got the woman. If they threw it out, he didn't. Uh, these guys around here, some of them, there's so many stories in my family of Filipino men doing that. I remember my aunt saying that her mother took the, she really liked this guy, and uh, to marry her daughter, and of course, my aunt did not like the, the guy at all. And so when she got home and she saw the sack of all kinds of cheese and meats and everything in there in the kitchen, my aunt said she got so mad she took that sack and threw it out under the road. <laughs> but uh, in the case of my grandmother and grandfather, they got together and they married, uh, as many did. Now, my grandfather and grandmother had to go to Tijuana to get a marriage license. They had to go there because they could, my grandmother being Catholic and my grandfather being Catholic, I guess they wanted to be married in the church and uh, they couldn't. So uh, here, because they couldn't get a marriage license. So on Halloween 1929, uh, they went to uh, Tijuana and got married. Um, so how does that happen? So my grandfather, as many of the Pinoys, they either worked in the fields or they worked in the restaurants. That was pretty typically, or some, some of them were housemen in the homes, but more often than not, they were kitchen workers or field workers, but as were the Indians. So the Indians particularly working in the fields here, the American Indians. So they got together and uh, again, the offspring now come up saying, there's Indian power, and now the, the Filipinos are claiming and wanting to know our identity. Who are we? How are we? And so we, the problem is we look towards, well, sh am I Filipino? Am I American Indian? What am I? How do I negotiate this? And already we're in trouble because we're running to definitions rather than embracing what is already right there in front of us, this coming together of two kind, cultures that shared so much as a consequence of an indigenous history. And that's what we're all trying to reclaim. How do you reclaim an indigenous history then in a place that you're not 
necessarily indigenous to. Already there's a problem with that question. If you were born here, you're indigenous. Claim it, right? But you have a rich history that can now inform what constitutes you as an indigenous person. Say in California, in Santa Rosa, California, all of a sudden your indigenous history will be one that will include elements of the Filipino culture, the colonizing culture of Catholicism, all these things come together, but they don't, we make war of them in ourselves rather than make peace among them in ourselves. And that's what we have to do. A good example is look at a lot of the Mexican rural Catholicism. They're so mixed, the indigenous cultures in South America, yes, many of them are Catholic, but they're having visions all over the place still as Indians. They may see the Virgin Mary, but they're having more visions than people have had in Europe in the last 300 years. It's Indians having visions still. It's religion alive, connected to the land. How do we make it alive again? How do we bring it back? First of all, stop the categories. Embrace all that's in you. It's, you, you don't have to go anywhere. That's the other problem with the Western world. We're always going, we're always looking. Oh, I wish, I wish the landscape looked the way it used to. Sorry, it doesn't and it won't ever. It's gonna go on, but be a part of the going on. And the only way you can be a part of the going on is claim what has happened and what our ancestors did, whether they were in the provinces in the Philippines or in the villages here, in this place, or as a consequence of colonization coming together, regardless what they did is went on, for better or for worse, for the, to continue our human history. So a couple things here. First of all, get rid of, don't be bound by definitions, negotiate them. Negotiate them in yourselves, negotiate them, but don't let them define you because already that's the colonizing tendency to separate you from your life, from your land, from your experience that continues. It's a living monster that we continually have to doctor in ourselves. And if we're going to do any doctoring or medicine, it has to be to undo the tendency to take us from the totality of who and what we are and our histories together. Um, so that brings back um, a, lot of the, a lot of other questions about how does this happen? What, are there organized rituals? A lot of this is going to have to be indigenous as it always was. It has to come from the land. There was, remember, religion like culture, like identity is not something in a box. It's fluid. I always get these things when I, I wrote a story of, uh, about children's literature or something, and they said, well, those aren't traditional stories. Well, what's traditional? Our culture's always in motion. We're part of that motion. The trick, again, of colonization is if we internalize and take ourselves out of that motion, we're powerless then. So create the rituals. The land will speak to you of that. You must stop. Stop and hold yourself in place. Whether it's on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan or in a redwood forest or next to the ocean, stop and claim that entire, entire experience. Religion and so forth and rituals will come for that. There are some organized kinds of things that we can do participate in, but make them yours. Don't make them something you have to somehow be right to, to adjust to, and all of that sort of thing. That's again the judgment of the Western world and Western religions where you're not good enough as you are. Whatever religion and group things, ceremonies we create, the ancient indigenous ceremonies were always those things that healed separateness and brought us together. So whatever you're doing in ritual and prayer, is it connecting you to others and those parts of yourself or not? And that's where you, how you want, want to think about religion and place in yourself. Is it something that is spreading the roots or connecting you to the roots that are already there? Is it lighting those roots, that light that connects you and all living things to one another in the world? Is it doing that? 
in small ways, in large ways, with yourself or with 100 people or with 50 people? Is it doing that? And those are the things, that's what you want to do. I can't, I would be, I wouldn't, I'd be a hypocrite if I were to sit here and give you a bunch of rituals to do. Um, or maybe I'd go on Oprah or something like that. But um, uh, I can't do that. But I can tell, I think I can say a little bit about how to think about rituals and how to think about things. Again, in the indigenous way of ritual to heal disconnection. Disconnection brings sickness, brings death, brings the end of the world. Connection brings life. So whatever each and everything we do, it must be something that brings us together, that, that grows life, that grows all the disconnections within us. And that is what healing is, bridging those gaps. Art and literature, they are like songs, they are like plants. They should do what nature and the outdoors does for us. The best of art, the best of literature, the best of ceremony, the best of healing, creates wonder. Wonder makes us wonder again. Wonder makes us humble, makes us open. And again, the things you read, literature, poetry, art, dance, all of these things should again, in the best sense, make us wonder. And wonder is a kind of openness that again will move us in the direction of healing, of connecting, of empathy. Art, literature, I know, I write the best and I teach literature. The goal, I think, of writing, whether it's oral literature, written literature, is to once again get us to have some empathy, whether for another human being, whether for a historic situation, whatever. But empathy is what a prerequisite for doing what I said earlier, connecting to everything around us. You can't connect if you can't be emphatic if you can't feel. So reading and literature is a way, I think, also of ceremony, of healing in the best senses of it. So as you go forward in your conference, I am so, I wish I could be there because hear all the wonderful things that you're going to talk about and talk with you. I, so I always think I'm best when I am talking with people instead of at them. But uh, again, as I said at the beginning of my talk, I'm humbled and honored to be here today. Um, I'm thankful to Lenny Strobel and to all of the people who've organized this conference. I'm thankful to all of you who've come because that's an indication you care. Thank you for caring. And finally, my ancestors, all of them, Filipino, American Indian, Anglo, and all of your ancestors, we're doing them good. We're doing them justice. We're continuing the life that they continued with their lives. Thank you all.